the Palestinians are denied free exit and entry into their own land. They do not have free movement. We didn't have free movement under apartheid. Hello and welcome to the Africa News Network. Why is it all right for a Palestinian journalist to be murdered, but it's not okay for a journalist from Canada to be murdered? What, what kind of value system is that? We've been silent about Shireen Abu Akleh. She was murdered, murdered before our eyes. The media today, since the period of the embeddedness of Iraq, totally without objectivity, except Al Jazeera, that's the only one. The rest, I'm sorry. But you need to be active proponents of an objective media that informs, that is balanced, and that tells the truth. Not a media that lies and tells you a quarter of the story. So we've got to address all these things. So the fundamental crises of our time call for international responses in our view. If we accept that the world is increasingly more fragmented, it provides an opportunity for those concerned with economic justice, yourselves, to work toward creating a genuinely progressive alternative. Progressive forces around the world need to push for multipolarity and a strengthened, fairer, and more inclusive multilateralism by exerting more influence on global debates. We should not be silent. We should be having loud views. We need to make our economies work for the common good, and we need to take all the measures necessary to protect our planet. We believe that what is needed is a different kind of multilateral architecture, which is more suited to today's challenges of the world. In our own view, Comrade Ronnie, despite its inadequacies, it is our belief that the United Nations must remain the primary locus for political security and development decision-making as it remains the most representative global body, despite its shortcomings. We believe a complete overhaul of the UN system is needed so that the UN Security Council is democratized and reflects the current balance of forces in the global system. It's unacceptable, eight decades nearly after its creation, five nations still wield disproportionate decision-making power in the Security Council, and those five number among the most problematic countries in the world the causes of many of the problems I refer to today. So the overhaul of the UN system should include enforcement of decisions taken by, by what we hope will be a democratized UN Security Council. We also believe we should no longer accept a situation where countless UN resolutions are passed by the vast majority in the UN General Assembly, but are merely ignored. We've had repeated calls, as Comrade Khalida said, from UN member states for Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories to the 1967 borders. These decisions have been ignored, and instead, we have witnessed the burgeoning expansion of illegal settlements on Palestinian land, growing oppression of the Palestinian people, gross violation of their human rights, and the Gaza Strip being turned into an open-air prison, regularly denied electricity, water, and fuel. The current denial is not new. It's been happening time and time and time again. For 16 years, Gaza has been under siege, with its people struggling to survive the ongoing land, air, and sea blockade imposed by Israel, with Palestinians denied exit and entry into the Strip. I was horrified when one of our former leaders, comrade, I don't know if I should call him comrade anymore, comrade Terra Lekota, 
said that Israel is not an apartheid state. Well, the Palestinians are denied free exit and entry into their own land. They do not have free movement. We didn't have free movement under apartheid. Palestinian people use separate entrances when they go through the border. We had to use separate entrances under apartheid. Palestinian children do not have free access to education. It was the same for us. So I don't know what more Israel should do for Comrade Likota to recognize that it is an apartheid state. We've seen today increased Israeli aggression under the most far-right Israeli government we've ever seen. And we've seen the inaction by the Security Council, the very body whose mandate is to maintain international peace and security. Despite the fact that the root cause of this conflict is illegal op occupation, we have heard a tirade of criticism of Palestinians from Western powers, an unflinching support for the occupying power. Despite the fact that I've been called all kinds of names because I refused to call Russia an occupying power of Ukraine, I have always objected to double standards. These type of double standards are the result of a global system which is skewed in favor of the powerful to the detriment of those fighting for their rights and self-determination. I repeat, it is imperative that social movements raise their voices in solidarity with the Palestinian people, particularly given the notably biased media coverage of the current violence. Within the United Nations, we have seen almost unanimous support among member states for ending the illegal economic blockade of Cuba which is now entering its 61st year. Yet, the Cuban people continue to be denied access to life-saving medicines, essential goods, and the right to trade as any other sovereign nation. These are injustices that once more need to be taken up by the Global South and progressive forces worldwide to create a groundswell of popular support for the Cuban people, as well as the people of Palestine and all oppressed people all over the world. We are also articulating calls that we should overhaul the current global financial and trade architecture. And much of the world is joining us in this call. We believe we need a fundamental reset of the Bretton Woods institutions including the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. Multilateral development finance institutions need to be redesigned to respond to the challenges we are confronted with and to assist countries to meet the sustainable development goals. They must help us respond effectively to public health emergencies and to mitigate climate change. The IMF needs to be repurposed and should provide counter-cyclical lending in times of debt distress, enable debt restructuring and relief, and provide liquidity to all countries that require it. We are fortunate as South Africa to be part of the BRICS partnership. And in BRICS, as the BRICS countries, we've been working toward developing a more equitable, balanced, and representative global governance system. This includes the restructuring of the global financial architecture. We have built up an institution such as the New Development Bank, which we own as BRICS, and it has given us as emerging economies greater control over lending and greater autonomy over the progress and course of our development. As we discussed in the most recent BRICS summit, which we hosted as South Africa, the concept of countries opting to conduct trade in their own currencies is to us a welcome development. And we are now investigating how we can multiply such practice and have it available to all of us. Emerging economies are key 
to reforming global governments. The fact that we've had emerging economies holding the G20 presidency for the last four years is an opportunity that we should not waste as countries of the South. Indonesia held the presidency last year and brought back development issues into G20. India held it this year and sustained that focus. Brazil is assuming the G20 chair next year and we must ensure it holds the ground. And in 2025, South Africa will be chair of G20. And again, we must strengthen the progressive ground. With leading countries of the global South able to set the world agenda, this is an opportunity for all of us to push for real change. Let's not waste it. The demands that were made over 50 years ago by the global South, when it met as NAM, that we should overhaul the rules of international trade, reform the international financial system, and recognize the sovereignty of each state over its natural resources. All of these articulated over 50 years ago are gaining momentum today. As the great revolutionary leader of Cuba, President Fidel Castro said, we need to unite today to build the tomorrow we yearn for, to vindicate the always excluded, and to rescue faith in humanity. I hope we can do this, and I thank you for listening to me.